Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Michael Franti here, and welcome to the Stay Human podcast. I am super excited for this week's guest because he's somebody who um, I love as a musician and love as a person. We were able to tour together with John Mayer. We're trying to figure out how many years it's been, and we, we we're measuring it by you know, some people measure like rings around a tree. We're measuring by like the height of our kids, the age of our kids. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's been uh, like nine or 10 years since that time. And, uh, you know, while touring alongside artists such as John Mayer and Dave Matthews Band, um, David Ryan Harris, who is our guest, has released six solo albums and he's written or co-written with the likes of Guy Sebastian and Lupe Fiasco, James Bay, Philip Phillips, Cadet Tedeschi Trucks Band, uh, Mark Broussard, Hunter Hayes, who I love, uh, Lady Annabellum, the Shadow Boxers, Hootie and the Blowfish, Gary Clark Jr., and just tons more. He's a songwriter, producer, singer, and musician with studios in both Los Angeles and Nashville. And he's got a beautiful uh, album of covers uh, of songs that are political songs, which can be found here on Made in America. Uh, that's Made in America and with his group, The Hush Money. And so please welcome to the show. This is David Ryan Harris. How you doing, David? Man, I am great uh i was thinking about um I, I think i need to go to the bank to uh apply for a loan and i would like to have you as my hype man that was fantastic ah uh, man you got it man <laughs> <laughs> i i don't know if i'll get you any money but i guarantee you they'll, they'll all be listening to your spotify channel by the time we walk out <laughs> so, hey baby steps if that's if that's how we get them in the go. door that's fine <laughs> nice hey you know the Stay Human show is all about the belief that I have that there's no one that you wouldn't love if you knew their story. And so I want to talk about your music and I want to talk about you as a songwriter and as a producer. But before that, I want people to know about who you are just because I'm curious. Um, where did you grow up? What was your family like as a kid? Um, I grew up, well, I was born in uh, Evanston, Illinois, like just outside Chicago, uh, suburb mm -hmm. of Chicago. Um, my parents, my dad's from Atlanta. My mom is from Detroit. They met in Chicago. Um, both kind of uh, huge music lovers. Neither neither of them sang or played an instrument, but I think that was really, mm. really big in their sort of connection. Um, and when I was about seven or so, we moved to Atlanta, which is where my dad is from. So I say that I was um, I was born in, in Chicago, but I learned how to do bad stuff in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> uh in you know a, a a little little suburb called decatur georgia and um uh, mm -hmm. you know i mean i don't know i don't want to skip too far uh, ahead in the story or like take away your your um your questions but you know i was i feel like i was really fortunate to be um be in that city at that time and um yeah, I just I loved uh, it was a really great time for for music and a great great place to be atlanta did, did you grow up with brothers and sisters i have a younger brother um but not musical at all. And we're like five years apart. And I think five years is like that. It's the perfect window where like you don't go to high school together. Hmm. Uh, you just kind of have separate friends, you know. So we're close in that we're family, but we didn't really have a lot of, uh, you know, we didn't get into trouble together as brothers or anything. Yeah. And that sibling rivalry, was it there or was it that kind of like you were always the older brother and you're always looking out for a kid brother? I was kind of, it was, it was that scenario. I was always sort of the older brother there, you know, there's really nothing to compete for when you're five years apart. You're not trying to compete yeah. for the same girls or you didn't like the same music or, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, uh, weren't trying to get the same quarterback spot or, you know, any of that stuff. So in, in that regard, um, the five year spread was, was, um, was a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. And what did your folks do? Um, my dad did all kinds of stuff. Uh, he was like a, a traveling salesman at one point. He worked for Hunts, uh, um, mm -hmm. like selling tomato sauce. Um, when I was uh, in my early, I grew up right next to a Hunts factory. You did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my dad was selling and, and their there wares. Was, th there was a time of year when the whole town smelled like ketchup for like three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, uh, what's your uh, what's your um, what's your relationship with ketchup right now? In, at this uh, point? I love it. Okay. I, I, I I still love it. Yeah. Um, he, so he kind of uh, my dad was you know super funny, really charismatic. So he did lots of stuff in my early teen years. 
he um he was a welder so he had like a mm -hmm. a burglar bar shop so he made like burglar bars and wrought iron steps and mm -hmm. stuff like that it actually taught me how to weld and do that stuff when i was uh i don't know 14 or so 14 or 15. and my mom uh the only job that i ever really knew her to do um she worked for a guy doing like medical billing um mm -hmm. and they worked in this huge i think about it, it was like this huge building and like this one huge room and she was like the only person in this gigantic room i don't think i think it was just the two of them which you know now i think about it, it must have been you know on one hand really lonely but on the other hand like really cool to not have to uh deal with any any other co-workers or <laughs> you know she I, re I remember like on the times when she couldn't get anybody babysit i would go to work with her and i distinctly remember like the radio would be as loud as you know anything and listening to you know doobie brothers uh -huh. or you know all all that's you know really good mid to late 70s uh radio yeah yeah i grew up with that music too um there's so many just great songs and just great so sounds that have memories for me um as a kid and was was radio a part of your life like you'd go there with your mom you'd hear all this great sounds was it part of your childhood growing up um um, did your parents play music in the house? Or? My dad always had all the cool records and all, like he was a, a huge like uh, bebop guy. So he loved like okay. straight ahead jazz. And, um, you know, I think that was, you know, the, 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 the scene, I guess, when they were getting together, Miles had, you know, an amazing band, Miles Davis at the time. And then, you know, you have the Chicago blues scene. And my mom is, I was, my mom loves the blues. That's her, that was her jam. And my dad love jazz but my dad also was the one that was you know he was a record store guy so he had all the cool records so it would be like you know uh uh bitches brew but then he also had prince's dirty mind uh mm -hmm. and you know music was definitely always um always going in the house um yeah i remember them you know entertaining when i was really little and you know the music is the one thing that i remember like i don't remember the smell of cigarettes or any of that i just remember music's playing playing all the time, uh -huh. all the time. and as a kid were you at all um into music or was it something that like you were singing in the house or was it an instrument that you picked up at somewhere at some point or how did you personally come into thinking like man this is something that i might want to try family legend has it um that I've just sang before, almost before I could talk. So I've always okay. been singing or I find myself, you know, humming under my breath and, you know, wouldn't even realize I was singing. So that was always um, in me. And there was there was never a, a big moment for me where I was like, oh, I want to be uh, an entertainer or I want to be famous or I see myself in this particular um, uh, you know, see my, I don't want to see my name in bright lights. That was never, I never had that kind of moment singing was just always something that came natural to me and i think the the looking back on it now um it always just soothed me like i could have a a melody or i could have um a lyric that would apply to a situation and i realized that it's just, you know it was a companion for me uh even then but you know there was definitely no no one in my family was a musician um yeah, I, I mean, my my falling into music had more to do with uh, just I got to the point where I felt like it was something I was kind of born to do. And, um, you know, kids now, I say the kids, uh, people now can sort of plot out a course from, you know, YouTube videos and, you know, how do you do this or how do you get a record deal? You go online and you figure out all these kinds of things. But, at the you know, in, in those days for me, that was so far from anything like I, I figured you got a record deal from you know maybe a guy overheard you singing in the grocery store or something and he's like oh you're gonna be you know be a big star so um i just did it because i because i loved it and i just sort of fell up I, there was never like i think if i put this group of people together and it's going to be the thing that's going to make it it was always just me kind of this is a, this is something that i love and over time i was you know fortunately able to develop a voice with it and um you know something that um you know seems somewhat calculated to me because i know where the musical bodies are buried but it, it it's something that's unique and and um appeals to other people and so i'm always you know slightly surprised that people are in 
into what it is that I do. Yeah. You know, you were mentioning how um, certain songs would resonate with you or the lyrics would just make you feel whatever it was that was going in, on in your life. Do you remember a time in your life, especially as a teenager, where maybe you were in a place of like uncertainty or darkness or sadness or or any kind of thing when that music really you just you felt like, man, I, I went to this song and it made me, you know, express everything that's in my heart right now. Did you have like an awakening moment like that for you where music was suddenly like more than just that hit on the radio, but it really touched your soul? There were, you know, there were a couple things. One of the things that made me want to try to figure out um, how to create stories, I distinctly remember sitting in the middle of the floor and I kind of positioned myself perfectly between the giant stereo speakers that my dad had. And I remember listening to songs in the key of life and it was a double fold out record. And I don't know why I decided that this was the record I was going to plant myself in the middle of the living room and just go through. But uh, hearing those sounds, um, just how how layered it was and being able to read the lyrics and see the picture. And I remember the, you know, sort of uh, sepia tone of, of the actual record. I felt like I was put in someone's world. And I just remember being like, this is incredible that I feel like I'm transported into the middle of this person's world. And none of the, you know, all of the songs aren't about the same thing, but they all were held together with his voice and his musicianship and sort of what Stevie's heartbeat was. And I just remember something went off in me. It was like, well, I, you know, I want to create that kind of thing. And Prince did it for me later as well. And some of it had to do, I think, with the fact that both of those guys were multi-instrumentalist, um, but they were very, um, just really good at sort of creating a world and visually taking you to a place. So that's kind of one part of it. Um, I remember my mom and dad um, split up and there were certain songs that uh, would just like destroy my mom and in turn sort of uh, destroy me. One of those being uh, Midnight Train to Georgia Obviously, we moved from Chicago to Georgia, and you know I remember listening to those lyrics, and I could see my mom, and I would like I would I would draw the line between one and the other, and I could see how that song gutted her. And there was a this uh, other song, this um, Kenny Rogers song, "Through the Years," um, mm -hmm. and that song would come on like I, I my mom just passed a little while ago, like I'll, I'll almost start crying here, but. Uh, through the years would come on and I would like dance on my mother's like my feet would be on her feet and you know I, we would just be holding each other and she would uh, she would just cry and I would cry because she was crying and it, it was there was no way to uh, for that not to be interwoven with that song and those lyrics and just how um, um, music can help you kind of mark time and deal with emotion um, uh yeah, just really sort of sort of mark time and um, bring you both pain and you know um, great joy. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that because it's really powerful. Um, <clears throat> you know, I remember when I was a uh, a young dad. Just you know, I was probably uh, you know twenty two, twenty three, and and uh, I had my first son already, and I was a you know, working in a guitar store in Berkeley, California. And Charlie Hunter, actually, the great guitarist, had given me this, uh, uh, My Funny Valentine um, cassette, Miles Davis. And I remember I was just going through a time in my life that was so challenging and so painful, um, being this young dad, not really knowing what I was trying to do, not really knowing how to be a dad not having a job except this working in this guitar shop, repairing guitars. And I put on that cassette and just like the first three chords of the, of the song on the piano. And it just, it, it just made me cry. I just burst into tears. And there I was like, listening to this record over and over again. It would just take me to this place. And I realized for myself that um, I wanted my music to be something more than just, 
um, songs or just more than political statements about the world, but that I wanted it to be there for people when they were in their most vulnerable moments like that. Um, and what you describe there is really, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's such a picture and i remember doing the same thing with that stevie runder record songs in the key of life <laughs> listening to all the sound effects of living just enough for the city and they're coming in there's you hear the trucks going by you hear amazing this drug deal take a place all this stuff so as an artist um at what point did you then start to pick up an instrument and say hmm this is like a thing like i've i've got this like you know, there's this power out there of music and, and how can I start to harness it? And what were the first things that you were starting to do musically? Um, you know, I really only, I love the, I love the idea that these guys were putting together <clears throat> their own world and they were able to transport you um, pretty much wherever they wanted to take you. Uh, and I wanted to be able to do that, but I knew I couldn't do it just as a singer. And me picking up guitar, was really kind of by process of elimination. I just wanted to be able to write songs and uh, keyboard, you know, you can't take to the park. And, you know, guitars just seemed like the thing to do. And, you know, looking back on it, it was a really like uh, uh, an amazing time for guitar because we're talking like, you know, 84, 85, and, you know, you got all the hair band stuff and some, you know, truly virtuosic guitar players and, you know, I had to kind of look around and say, all right, do I want to do Eddie Van Halen where I practice for eight hours or am I just trying to like, you know, do my thing? Uh, and I decided, you know, I don't want to practice guitar for eight hours. I was just trying to have a vehicle so I could tell my stories. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, it really was kind of the perfect storm of that. And I really got into these, ba a lot of bands from, from the UK there's this band called Japan that I really loved, and I love Thomas Dolby and The Cure. Oh and, yeah, I love all that. Yeah, and The Smiths, and um, you know, a, kind of a freak in my neighborhood. But they had this this sense of like there was this DIY kind of mentality to the whole thing. So um, it just kind of reinforced it, for me that the guitar is just kind of a tool because you know you have people like the Sex Pistols that aren't you know necessarily great musicians, but they use the, their instruments like a hammer or a nail or you know whatever to build the thing that they are trying to get you to see um yeah. so for me early on you know i just wanted to pick out like i didn't learn a bunch of p other people's songs i was literally trying to go like okay i got this melody in my head what are the sounds that are supposed to go uh that are supposed to accompany it yeah. and you know i had a friend that lived around the corner um uh the same age as me and he liked the same kind of weird you know weird music and uh he had a reel to reel tape recorder and you know we made you know made these recordings and you know that was just super exciting man to the first time you you put four tracks together of this idea that you had in your head and it's like oh those are the drums you know that's the the drum beat that i made and then i sang you know there's nothing uh, more magical than than seeing all that stuff kind of kind of come back or hearing yeah. it come back what's what's decatur like or what was was decatur like when you were a kid culturally um, and the school you went to and stuff it was a uh, i mean decatur itself is, is fairly large i lived uh in you know sort of the my, my neighborhood was predominantly a black neighborhood i think it was maybe two white families in in my neighborhood um mm -hmm. you know lower middle class i could walk to school my my elementary school was uh um maybe I don't know, half a mile away and then when i went to high school i went to um uh lakeside high school which is a, a predominantly white high school they had a, you know, a program there that was the m to m the um majority to minority and so i could walk to the high school that i was supposed to go to but i would only walk to the high school so i could catch the bus to go to this other high school um and my mom was you know super adamant about me you know getting uh a you know what she thought was a better education and you know i definitely definitely hated the fact that i would have to get up at like i have to leave my house at six o'clock in the morning to get to the bus because i had to catch like two school buses to get to my school and um you know i was like i just want to go to the school with you know my my friends that are in the neighborhood um but i'm glad that she sort of held uh 
held the line and made me, you know, go to this school because I got, you know, early, uh, you know, early Run DMC and Parliament Funkadelic and Rick James and all of that stuff at home. But then when I went to school, I got the Pink Floyd and the Led Zeppelin and, you know, the Cure and all of that stuff. So, like, I, you know, there's no musical situation that I, I'm not, you know, um, comfortable in and that I can't appreciate. And I know had I gone to my school and done my thing, I wouldn't have that. And when did what did your friends in your neighborhood think? Were you were you like coming home with like Robert Smith lipstick all over <laughs> and that kind of thing, or, or were you just coming home with the music a little bit and going, "Hey, check this out," or a little, you know? I mean, um, I was actually just talking to my son about this. Uh, I I see it now, and I didn't see it then because I don't think I necessarily wanted it. But I just have the kind of personality that people are kind of drawn to. So I think my friends in the neighborhood. They knew I was a, a good singer and a pretty good athlete. Um, so they just kind of would sort of shrug it off. You know, they, they I wouldn't say they looked up to me, but I think they knew um, I just had something about me that, you know, I didn't really get made fun of a lot. If if anything, they were like, oh, that's our, you know, that's our freaky friend, you know. And I, I didn't, I quit trying to dress, you know, the way that my friends dressed <laughs> in my neighborhood. But yeah. I didn't really adopt any other thing. Like I didn't come home with the lipstick. Like I had a you know motorcycle jacket. I got my ears pierced and all, all that kind of stuff. But I didn't go too far, too too far left because I knew <laughs> I still had to walk from uh, I still had to walk from that bus stop <laughs> back to my house. You, you had a safety zone you had to get through. Hey, yeah, I wanna, exactly. I want to play something. This is the first uh, David Ryan Harris music that I ever heard. Oh God. That is Follow For Now and uh, the track Holy Moses. That was the first um, music of yours that I ever heard. Tell me about that. Um, so there was a, you know, obviously there weren't a lot of black kids in my neighborhood that listened to, you know, you know uh, Thompson Twins and Simple Minds and, you know, Zeppelin mm -hmm. and the police and all that stuff. So naturally, anybody that knew any other people, uh, any other black folks, black kids in the neighborhood, they were like, oh, well, you should meet this, you know, dude, because he likes that same crazy shit you like or whatever. So I had a couple of friends that like put me in touch with other guys that were just kind of in the in the hood, so to speak. And um, one of them was the drummer of that band. Uh, and it turns out we actually went to, we were in school together in the second grade and then kind of went our own, uh, I moved away or whatever. Um, so it was him and this other guitar player and it literally was just friends like, oh, you like that kind of weird music. I know somebody else that does. So we got together with no agenda to be like an all black rock band or anything. It was just, just like, just like yeah. these are dudes that like the music that I like. And we didn't know, we knew enough to be dangerous. We didn't know that these things weren't supposed to go together. Uh, yeah. You know, the sensibilities that we got from, you know, our neighborhood and the sensibilities that we got from, you know, MTV at the time, which was a predominantly, you know, sort of uh, white thing and, you know, a rock thing. So we put this band together straight out of high school for me and just started playing shows because we loved to do it. I think, you know, I can't really remember what I would have thought success was at the time, but it certainly was not headlining arenas. Like success to me was probably being able to uh, play in a city other than my own and uh, drink for free, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that band really taught me so, so much about how to put songs together and what it means to put a show together and how it means, you know, we learn how to be men together um those are you know those are my those are my brothers um uh i i reflect on that incredibly fondly and you know i miss a lot about that that group but we were just like a you know just little punks just uh mm -hmm. you know trying to do our version of um you know 
Fishbone meets Bad Brains meets, you know, Jane's Addiction meets Soundgarden meets, you know, Sap, you know, whatever. We just threw it all together because those were the things that we that we loved. You know, that record got around because it was it was a record that I knew and I knew your guys music, um, but I didn't know that it was you. And, you know, you had follow for now and you're out there, you know, just really getting your first experience of music and touring and making records. And, and then, or at what point did you think like, you know, I want to start collaborating with other people. And, you know, I know you work with Dion Ferris from Arrested Development and you started working with a lot of other artists. Um, walk me through that kind of thing of saying like, as a, as a musician, as a writer, as a producer, that maybe there, there's more than me just being in a band in a van driving around the country. Honestly, having my first um, my first son, I was probably 24 or so. Um, Follow for Now had put out the one record, and we thought that our managers, although they really loved us, we didn't feel like they understood where we were coming from musically. And so we went to them and said, hey, we want to do um, something that is more us, and we're not really sure that you guys understand where we're coming from. Like, uh, you love us, but you're, you know, two older white guys from Alabama like so we went to them in the the most in the most gentle um respectful way and said you know we'd like to do get other managers and I think their feelings were really hurt and they responded by suing us which really kind of just broke the band apart we dealt with it for as much as we could deal with it and then I had this son and we were playing these shows and I felt like we were playing the same songs and kind of got to be like a little bit of a novelty act and then I just had a couple people that came and said hey you know, I'm uh, Dion Ferris came and she's like, "Hey, I'm making this um, this record, and I, you know, I, we we loved your we looked up to your band or whatever. Would you like to write some songs for for me?" So we wrote a couple things together, and then uh, her A and R guy was uh, Randy Jackson, uh, and Randy was like, "Hey, man, you know, I'm supposed to be producing this record, but I really dig what you do. You should, you know, you should do it." And so for the first time, I found you know myself with. Um, my, my buddy Milton um, in the middle of a studio kind of telling people what to do and um, you know realize all of, all of all of the time that I spent looking over engineers shoulders um, in my career was not for naught. Randy Jackson was producing her record and he was like hey you should you know you should do this you can produce this record uh, which is a huge honor and probably definitely for myself fighting above my pay grade at the time um but you know it kind of helped me figure out what it means to work with other people because i was only used to working with the guys in my band and it's just a different kind of relationship because those are like literally my brothers sometimes i have to figure out the diplomatic way to tell you know it's just like family um and so i did that and over the the course of doing that i, I remember i played randy these you know 30 songs or so that i had done on my uh, cassette four and eight track and uh i you know, obviously I thought that all 30 were amazing and he listened to him and was like, hey, you know, I like these four. Uh, and I remember thinking, because those songs are uh, spread out over the cassette, I know that he's not saying that he likes just the whole, the first four. So I'm, I'm, I feel honored that he listened to the whole thing. And I also feel honored that he's not going to bullshit me. Like, that'll be my guy. You know, he's, I'm not going to play him something and he's just going to tell me what I want to hear. So... Um, that record came out on Columbia. Fast forward a few years later, and a really good friend of mine, Brendan O'Brien, like a super um, prolific rock producer, um, produced a bunch of Pearl Jam and Stone Temple Pilots and Bruce Springsteen, Rage Against the Machine um, from Atlanta. He got a label deal through Sony, um, and he could essentially take his any of his acts to any of the Sony associated labels. So that was at the time it was uh, Sony was sort of the 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 umbrella, and then under that was Columbia, Epic, uh, Five Fifty, and one other that I can't remember now. Um, so I was like the second person signed to Brendan's label as a solo artist. Uh, I put this record out. It you know sold. 3,700 copies or so, you know, or so. And one of those happened <laughs> to be, uh, you know, one one of the people that happened to buy that record was John. That um, He, I guess, somehow came across a record when he was at Berkeley. Um, and, uh, you know, he dug the record. He moved to Atlanta um, fresh from Berkeley and was just kind of like, hey, I, I got to find that dude to put that record out. Um, and we kind of became friends before he had a deal and, you know, just 
sort of had this brother brotherhood kind of love for you know i always say we pick a lot of the same uh we, we pick a lot of fruit from the same tree he and i and just had a you know uh -huh. instant kind of um just mutual respect kind of thing and i was just starting to do solo acoustic stuff because i you know i didn't start out on acoustic guitar guitar i started straight on electric so i didn't get an acoustic till like you know much later in my career and not having a band at this point having lost my record deal and all that stuff i was just like all right how do i play shows and figure out how to do this thing and he was you know really masterful at um the you know singer songwriter kind of thing um so that period of time was really um really helpful for me and kind of bridging the gap between you know two parts of my musical life yeah you know one of the things that uh I think of it when I think of your music is that you have this ability to um, interpret pop songs, you know, and really, you know, hit songs uh, a, a, as a producer, as a writer, uh, as a singer. And yet at the same time, you have this incredible love of just musicianship. And I could see you equally at home in uh, kind of like John, where it's, it, you know, an arena pop show, or it could be, you know, jamming with the dead. Talk to me about that for you, about how just you, you, you kind of um, are able to go between those two worlds of just the love of musicianship and, and, and also the pop sensibilities. I think um, early on with Follow For Now, like, one of our favorite bands in town was uh, Colonel Bruce Hampton and the Aquarium Rescue Unit. Who, you know, I don't know if you know, you know those guys. Yeah. Um, you know, like hands down, like some of the best musicians I've ever been in a room with. And for some reason, they really liked our band. Uh, and you know, I couldn't, I, none of us could play as well as, you know, you know, our drummer couldn't play, you know, drums as well as their drummer you know we were they were just miles ahead of us but they loved mm -hmm. what we did and it it kind of made me feel like there is no hierarchy it's all kind of the same thing it's all about communication and i all you know i'd always sort of felt like there's pop music isn't better than punk music you know dc go go isn't any better than you know chicago blues it's just kind of all the same thing but i really think having those guys be such a fan of us that was really something that um made me realize it's just about communication and the the venue is uh the the smallest piece of the puzzle um so it can be you know it can be pop stuff in an arena or singer songwriter stuff in a coffee house and it's just about um you know a little bit of escapism for the audience is a little bit of you telling um a story or narrative that you're trying to tell and you know realizing you know if you, you you're playing an arena like one tour john had me open for him and i'm just playing solo electric nobody knows who i am and so we're playing these arenas and it's just me by myself uh terrifying and no you know i don't have any songs on the radio it's just like a, you know these people are here to see him and who's this dude uh playing these songs and i realize like Oh, the room is as small as I want to make it. Like, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I realize that the thing that I do, I'm not reaching for the back row. That's not the kind of music that I make. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that that means I'm, uh, that isn't my metric for success. I'm just trying to connect with somebody. So I just got in the habit of finding the people, the pockets of the room that are paying attention that I'm connecting with. And that's who I'm talking to. I'm not trying to, you know, I realized uh, kind of early on um, dynamically if you really want to make people be quiet in a bar or whatever you're playing, you don't get louder. You get a little bit loud and then you get real quiet and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just sort of playing with dynamics. So I think the the difference between those approach is just about dynamics. It's just about, um, you know, I love the Beatles, which is as pop as pop can get in terms of writing the, the playbook on what pop is. But then I also love Bad Brains and they're all just like methods of expressionism and nobody gets nobody's in the front of the class they're all the same they're all the same thing yeah yeah um i got two more questions for you the, the first one is just you know as a songwriter both as a, a solo songwriter and as someone who collaborates with other people to write 
how do you approach writing songs? Is do you have a methodology? Do you always start with the guitar first? Do you start with the word first, or does it change every time? Or is there some way that you've found that you can access it? Your your best songwriting, man. Um, there is no particular method. I I do think that for myself, well, for even when I'm writing with other people, I tend to be led melodically because the the voice and singing is what comes so natural to me. So a lot of times I will just go, uh, this is what I think I should sing next. What is what is the thing that goes under this that either is a place where people are expecting me to go or the place that's going to make people go, oh, I feel like the rug was taken out from under me. But it's all informed by the melody first mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, that sort of stuff. And then for in terms of subject matter, I do. Uh, I really loved Elvis Costello and uh, how literate he was and how he was really good at placing you in a room. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to always, probably to a fault, make sure that my lyrics can read as sentences. So there's not okay. a lot of there's not a lot of jumping around. Like I'm one, I'm not one of those people that writes in sort of abstract prose. If you can't figure out what it is I'm saying in a song, I don't know what to tell you. Like there's no there's not a lot of guessing, but what did you really mean in this thing? Like I try to paint a story yeah. and like I, you know, I literally try to make sure it works t together as a sentence where the, you know, the periods go and a comma would go here. And so I think that kind of helps keep me, um, uh, it just gives me uh, guidelines that I think are helpful for the way that I like to tell stories. Um, and, you know, Costello was really big for for me in that regard. Yeah. So the final question I want to ask you is, um, well, why in this time did you get into or, or with um, <clears throat> the Made in America record? Why did you want to go and and touch on these political songs? Is this part of who you've always been? Is this um, something you felt was needed now more than ever, or um, was just something you, you you had wanted to do? Um, so I'm 52, so that was for my 50th birthday, and I always wanted to like at my dad's funeral, he had um, different pockets of friends because, like I said, he kind of bounced around, was super charismatic, always the funniest dude in the room, and he had like. Those are some of his army buddies were in one corner. And then these were dudes that he worked with at Hunt. And these were, you know, all of these different people that had never met each other. And I was like, the one person that would rock this party is my dad. And he's not here. And I was <laughs> like, people will come from all over when you tell them to come because somebody's died. But they won't just come together because you're having a party on a Saturday night. So I was like, I really want... You know, my, I think of my friends as my roses. I was like, I want my, all my roses together when I can smell them. So I yeah. just try to think about, um, and I've always wanted to make a record where kind of like this mythology that I have in my head about how music from the Big Pink was made, where it's just a bunch of dudes living in a house and wake up in the morning and make coffee, they're reading the paper, eating breakfast together, and then they kind of, you know, uh, stumble into the studio and see kind of what happens. I, I love the, the, the romance of that idea of making a record so i said look i'm turning 50. uh i don't plan on dying anytime soon but as far as i'm concerned if you come to this thing i'm gonna let you off the hook uh and so i invited you know my my best friends that happen to also be uh musicians and another friend of mine is not a musician but is also but is always really close to musicians and i said you know we're, i want to go to sonic ranch down in el paso and um you know, the studio is outfitted so that no one really had to bring anything. The instruments are there. Um, everything's there. We're just going to show up. And so I had, a, you know, all the bases covered. I had a bass player and drummer and, you know, all, all my friends were going to show up. And then just before we were ready to go, I was like, I don't have any material. And <laughs> these people are all excited to be there. And they're going to be I'm going to be standing in the middle of this room without anything to do. So that just sort of met up with the idea that I was, you know, looking around at what the world looked like in 2018 and going, man, nobody, wait, nobody's 
like nobody sees what I'm what I'm seeing. Like nobody's there's no protest songs. There's no like, and even if it's not protest, like my thing was like if someone did a soil sample of what it feels like right now. There's no there's no part of the soil that feels like what it feels like right now. Um, yeah. If we pl if we planted a time capsule, there's nothing in that time capsule that feels like what right now feels like. And I'm never really um, political songs per se. That's not really I don't write those kinds of songs. Um, my songs tend to come from a more um, first person narrative. Um, but I knew that there were songs that touched on the way that I was feeling at the time. Um, and so I just had the idea of like, oh, I'm just going to do some songs that aren't necessarily protest songs. But I think if you hang them all together, you know, by song number three, the listener goes, oh, wait a minute. I see what's happening here. Uh, you know, this is before we decided to call it Made in America or, or any of that. And I had like a whiteboard with 30 songs on it or so. And we would just wake up in the morning and go, um, you know, I go, does anybody have anything on here that they feel particularly special about? And, you know, if not, then I would just sort of pick one and we would try to figure out a way to deconstruct it in a way that was um, respectful of the song, but also kind of put it in a different light. I think a lot of times if you pull the music out from uh, the bottom of some some of these uh, lyrics, the lyrics become a little more sharpened. Uh, yeah. You go, oh, wow, you know, I didn't realize that's what they were saying in that thing or, or whatever. And so we had a really good time over um, four days just kind of doing the basic the basic tracks of this thing. And I wasn't 100 percent sure how to put it out or if I was going to put it out under. I just wasn't sure what I was going to do. So in the middle of last year, I'm still sitting on this record. I kind of shopped it around. I, you know, I think it's as. Um, worthy of being a jazz record or like a you know vocal jazz record as anything else that's out i mean if Nora jones come away with me it's jazz record and this is a jazz record but mm -hmm. i shopped it around everywhere and had a bunch of people go you know some people were like oh we don't we protest music doesn't sell or you know uh that was the one i got more more than anything um yeah. and so i just kind of sat on it and you know you go through that that period of sort of self-doubt i'm like well maybe it's not any good um, and then, you know, after the George Floyd thing and w w how the world felt, I was like, well, why am I sitting on this record when, you know, in yeah. 10 years from now when my kids are, you know, say, well, what were you doing at that time? You know, what was, how did your art reflect the times? Not that they mm -hmm. will say that, but in, in this, this story in my brain, if they do, I didn't want to say that I was putting out stuff that wasn't relevant so i was like yeah. i'm gonna put this record out and i don't really know um what it's going to mean or how it's going to do but i know that this is how i feel and um yeah so I, you know i put it out i i wish that i had put it out under my name my sort of the long the long view for me um 2020 for me was supposed to be a solo kind of victory lap i was going to you know, go around the country, kind of go around the world and play the rooms that, you know, have been good for me and then sort of hang up my hat as a solo artist and just concentrate on producing and writing for other people. Um, but then, you know, not being able to tour at all, I was like, well, I guess I have to postpone my my victory lap. But by that point, I had already. <laughs> and so the, the thing was, I was going to start doing stuff. Um, the, the idea of the hush money. Um it just seemed like a cool name to me. This was long before I came up with the hush money probably five or six years ago before any of the hush money stuff of Michael Cohen. So it just happened to be, a, as I thought, a really cool, a cool name. Um, so um, uh, I lost my train. It is a uh, cool name. I um, love it. I, yeah, but I, I went. So the idea was that the hush money would allow me to do whatever I wanted to do because David Ryan Harris I've I've sort of set up a precedent for myself and people expect a certain thing and granted it's up to me to break out of that if I want to but I was like it's it, it this feels like dress up to me in a really cool way so you don't know what the hush money's going to do um yeah. so I put the record out under the hush money and then I have you know people that I know are legitimate David Ryan Harris fans that are like wait you put out a record called what like no one can find them. <laughs> they don't know that it's me. So I wish that I had put it out under my name, but it was all done under the guys at 
you know, I was about to do one final David Ryan Harris run, and then I would just put out weird records under the hush money from here on out. So I think I may actually re-release the record because um, it's been out uh, coming up on a year, and this oddly enough, those things are still very relevant. So I think I may re-release it under my name, add another song or two, and then the hush money will will put something out later. Cool. Well, I really encourage folks to listen to it because it's a it's a really powerful record and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different styles, like you said, of interpret of interpreting these classic, um, you know, political songs, um, and like when the way you touch on inner city blues or born in the USA um, are completely different takes on those songs that do really highlight the lyrics in them in a way that you know you're not used to you you're not used to hearing them, and it really gets across some of the power of of those songs um, lyrically. And uh, I just love the performance and I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Your vocal um, performance is just so, so powerful. And um, so for folks who don't know your music, it's actually kind of like a really good starting place. And then go back through and, and pick up all the other David Ryan Harris records and enjoy those too. Yeah, um, I, I would definitely say it, it does have all the, it has all the David Ryan Harris flavors and ingredients in that, in that record, even though those aren't my songs, even the musical turns, even though I didn't write them, though, all those things inform what it is that I do. Yeah. Hey, David, last question. What does it mean to you to stay human? Um, to stay connected and to realize that we are at our best. We are um, trying to figure out a balance between being of service and making sure that you never get lost in um, the giving of that service. Um, uh, to stay human is to um, learn how to be a good listener. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, learn that we're, that we're all kind of on the same, the same struggle. I, um, I, I've been telling people uh, a lot lately that I think we all are trying to get to the same place. We just disagree on how to get there. And staying human is to just be mindful of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is uh, that is it. And you know, to try to to, to try to keep people in their three dimensional or four dimensional self, as opposed to making them this two dimensional thing where you see someone's picture and then at the bottom of the screen it's you know school teacher or whatever like we are we have far more dimensions than that so the person in the car that's next to you is not just the asshole that cut you off they're the person that may be rushing home to you know uh, a, a sick you know mm. a, a, a sick family member um mm-hmm. and you know trying to stay in that space for me um it really isn't that difficult uh, because it, if you stay in that space i think it helps with like anger and um, you know, no one's on a no one's on a systematic campaign to make my my personal life as I'm as I'm going through my day to day business. The people that I come in contact aren't on some sort of systematic campaign to make my life horrible. Um, and if I can just take a minute to realize that the same um, the same soup that I'm swimming in, the you know the cashier is swimming in the same kind of soup that I am. It's different ingredients, but she's still in the same soup. Like I, I was on a, a tech support call the other day with this woman. She's like, I got to tell you, you're really for, you're really, um, really patient. And I was like, a long time ago, I said that I was going to try to um, direct my anger towards the people that earned it. And you didn't make this product. Uh, you know, you're just, you're going through a script trying to help me do my thing. And you personally are not responsible for this. So I'm not going to yell at you. You're just doing your your job and it's amazing how you when people hear that they are instantly disarmed because they go into a situation expecting to have someone yell at them or to be uh you know to blame them for something and it's a really powerful tool that we have to keep us connected and human awesome hey man thanks for being with me today it's great to see you again and you as well man and to hear just to learn about your story and learn about where you come from and and how it all feeds into the music that you're making today. Um, if folks want to get in touch with you or want to keep up with what you're doing musically, where what's the best way to, to, to do that? I mean, I guess it's Instagram, uh, which is DRH3 is my, um, is my screen name. I have Facebook and all that other stuff, but um, 
Instagram is probably the on place the gram. To, yeah, on the gram. All right. Well, this has been uh, this week's episode of the Stay Human podcast with the great David Ryan Harris. Uh, check out his latest release, Made in America, from his group, The Hush Money. And then go back and listen to all of his records. There's so much great music there. And uh, the more you know about him, the more you research it, what he's done, you'll, you'll find all the other artists that he's worked with, and you'll hear um, his, his flavor in with all their tracks too. So David, thank you so much for being here today, bro. And, uh, I can't wait to see you out. Not on a victory lap. I'm calling it <laughs> the comeback, man. The come, the come up, man. There we go. Yeah. Let's hope still so. got a lot to offer us all on, on the live stage as well as the production. So, um, I look forward to seeing you out there as soon as we get through this whole COVID craziness. Yes, man. I look forward to seeing you as well. Um, you know, you don't get to, you don't have the, um, the benefit of hearing what people say about you behind your back, but like, I've never hear anything about you, uh, other than you are a good dude. And I'm happy to be able to echo that. I love, lo love your music. And I loved when you guys were out with us, the, the light that you are in the world. And, uh, I'm, you know, if I could give you a rose right now, I give you a rose right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks dude. a lot, brother. All right, man. Peace. Peace. Take care. You too.